We're going to start the Transportation Advisory Board meeting. However, we do not have a quorum this evening, so we won't be able to make any votes or motions. Um, so first off, I need to see if everybody's in an agreement that we can continue to do an informational-only meeting without voting and motions. Yeah. Okay. And I'll still do roll call. Okay, we'll still do roll, roll call. Taylor Wickland. Uh, here. David McInerney. Present. Steve Lehner. Here. Okay, um, we're going to move past number three, which was approved minutes, since we can't. Um, we can do communications from staff uh, and then go to uh, public comments. So, Phil, why don't you go ahead? Yeah, good, good evening, members of TAB. This is, uh, I'm Phil Greenwald, Transportation Planning Manager with the city, and we do... Uh, I'm trying to think of the different things that we need to chat about as far as communications from staff, but they're all in our information items. So I think we'll be good to chat there uh, with you about some of those items. We really wanted to formalize them this, this week or this month because there was a lot more to them. Um, with that being said, I'm trying to think if we've had any. We did have a council retreat this last weekend, and I did see Taylor there, so uh, board member Wickland, sorry, um, at, the, at that uh, event. So thank you for joining us and uh, being part of that. Uh, your comments were read into record, so uh, we appreciate your comments at that. Um, a lot of good stuff at the council retreat. It was a lot of transportation materials, so you will be busy in the next year. If not, we, we like to say in 2023, but in the next year you'll, you'll be busy. And hopefully we can uh, get some folks. Um, unfortunately, uh, Patrick did uh, submit his his um, his resignation, and so Patrick's no no longer able to be part of this board. He did he is moving away from Longmont, so with that he can't be part of the board anymore, and so he did submit his resignation. So we're very sorry to see Patrick go. We're going to start mid year uh, recruitments, just like we do every year with this board, but this one will take on a little bit more meaning as we believe we only had four people. Uh, or five people before, and now we're down to four. So this is a seven-member board. So anybody out there who's interested in in applying, please submit your name as, as soon as you can into the portal. There's a there's an application portal that we've all uh, put you through as team, team or board members. So we appreciate you doing that, and we will uh, request that more people uh, join and be part of this uh, board, this important board, and uh, uh, we look forward to filling out the rest of the seats uh, in July. Hopefully, we do our recruitments. And that's going to be one of the things we talk about is the recruitments that we do for this. In fact, I'll probably just, um, I think it was something we were going to talk about at the very end, but th that's something that we'll, we'll have to start working toward in April because we have basically April, May, and June to get those done. And June is really when we have to submit to the city council. So that's very important. So April will be a a big startup month. We'll be looking for people to sit on that, probably a two-member board like we or a two-member subcommittee like we had last time. So I'll ask at least two of you. If you all three want to or four want to be on that, that's fine too. Just we'll talk more about that in April. So thank you for your time on that. I believe that's all we have from Steph. Okay. <clears throat> uh, we'll move on to uh, uh, public comments. And um, just to reiterate, three minutes per. Uh, it's so great to see as many folks here that want to make comments. We like that. So with that, um, we'll go ahead and start. Um, did you have any names that you wanted to start off on the list? OK, Benjamin would be first. Thank you. There was like a timer. Okay. Okay. So I'm Benjamin Grabmeyer. I live at a 10640 Baron Circle in Firestone. And I'd like to make a few comments today regarding your, which was brought up in the last meeting regarding the regional EV plan. And I've I would like to bring up some numbers, but I think that's not a good idea. Um, electric vehicles 
ultimately it's a private vehicle that can sit usually sits about maybe four to six people if you're lucky uh, it definitely does not comply with the goal of the city in, in Vision Longmont to reduce the number of vehicle miles traveled. Um, a lithium battery contained in an electric vehicle, you need to, you need to mine about 90,000 pounds of ore per battery. It needs about 25 pounds of lithium, 35 pounds of cobalt, which you could fit about you know, a thousand smartphones worth of electricity in them. Uh, you need a 110 pounds of graphite, four, 90 pounds of copper, and 400 pounds of steel, just to get your, your battery working. And to give context for the mining aspect, lithium brines is what you get the lithium from. And a brine contain, and the pure, brine, pure lithium you know, it's only like 10% of the actual brine itself. So you, you're, you're at a severe disadvantage. Same thing for cobalt. You're only getting 10% out of that. So you have to mine about 30,000 30, pounds for your, for your 30 pounds of cobalt to, to fit into that battery. In all, you'd have to re extract about 500,000 pounds of materials uh, move all that over the battery life you could average that out that it consumes about five pounds of earth versus the 0.2 pounds in liquid oil equivalent uh, it requires um, so and you're you're essentially making a battery that can fit only hundred one barrel of oil but you need a hundred barrels of oil to do it. Um, and in addition to that, you're, you're having to transport all these materials by truck, which is 1,000% of the cost of moving it by pipeline. 75% of oil and 100% of natural gas is moved via pipeline. And so you're just going to be looking at these increased costs. Okay. And uh, that's what I have for today. Uh, just a couple numbers to think about as you move forward. Thank you. No, thank you, Benjamin. And Lonnie? My email said I had five minutes and that this was going to be with the city council also, so I'm going to have to cut my my speech a little short. Sure. Um, hello to the board members. My name's Lonnie Dooley. I live on, I live in Village Place Apartments, 600 Kaufman Street. I've lived in historic West Side for an, over 20 years. I've watched the traffic increase steadily over time. The increase in events downtown has been a great addition to making Longmont unique. Unfortunately, it's brought the expected increase in traffic and it's come into our neighborhoods. With it, the speeding cars and drivers who don't pay attention. I spoke to neighbors who told me they always walk their kids to school just because they don't feel safe to walk them themselves, to have them walk themselves. Um, I attended a downtown meeting a few months back to talk about what we can do to slow down traffic. It was agreed we have to change people's mindsets about driving in Longmont. Have signs that say people walk in Longmont or whatever wording will catch people's attention. Get on the offensive with our message. Don't be on the defense saying there aren't enough police. I understand that the police are short staffed, I get it. But to me it seems like they've just given up. I live in Village Place Apartments right on Main Street. On weekend nights now and later in the year it'll be every night. We hear and see cars just going by so fast. You know, they rev up at the 6th Avenue, or 6th, yeah, 6th Avenue um, um, light, and then again, coming the other way, Long's Peak, and they just fly. Um, every, even everyday traffic includes people who are speeding. Um, I don't understand why safe, uh, traffic safety isn't more pr priority to the police that we do have. We have an investment in this community and we deserve 
more than hearing, we don't have the personnel. People I've spoken to in my neighborhood say it's in general, they don't feel safe walking downtown. I feel that making downtown one way, each way is a good, or one lane each way is a good idea. It may again remind people they have to slow down. I also think speed bumps in neighborhoods are an effective way to catch people's attention. Taking people away from their phones and other devices and making them watch the road. Getting people to realize that driving a vehicle requires their full attention. It's not a time to be multitasking. Decorated crosswalks can stand out, such as Main Street and 8th, to catch people's attention and remind them to slow down. We have many talented artistic people in our community who may be happy to display their work while doing something to help the community. Neighbors in historic Westside had been asking for crosswalks to be painted at the four corners of Central Elementary School. They'd been put off with reasons like checking the budget and doing a study to determine if it was needed. When Tony was killed, our neighbor, Tony Umali, a neighbor was interviewed by Channel 9 News and within two weeks, the crosswalks were painted. I understand that neighbors have been working with the city to add crosswalks and more safety measures on 3rd Avenue as part of the project to complete the work on 3rd. Make it a blanket project. Get crosswalks painted all over town. Use the resources we have. Let people be reminded consistently, if ne constantly if necessary to slow down in Long Run. I'm glad the council adopted the Vision Zero initiative. It's an admirable goal and great start. So let's keep working on what we need in this town to make it safe. Can the neighborhoods do more for things for themselves? Can we help out? There's many people, citizens, and parents who want to do what we can to make things safer in Longmont. They want the council to know they will back them up if they see things being done. Thank you for hearing me. And then I know we have two more. We don't have your names. Or I'm sorry, three, right? We have, no? Okay. If you could just uh, give us your name and, sure. and where you live. Sure. My name is Brian O'Brien. Uh, my wife and I live at 321 Gay Street. And um, I, I would like to, I basically wanted to say thank you to the um, city for um, making some improvements around the Central Elementary School. We live on one of the um, southwest corner um, of the schoolyard, so we can see the playground and the, the front drive of the school. And uh, as recent as this morning, uh, watching the, it's very busy when um, parents drop off in the morning, especially like today when the clocks changed on Sunday morning, uh, everybody trying to be timely. And um, uh, the problems still exist. Uh, you probably know that it's not a school where people are bused in. All the children come either walking on a bike or a scooter or in their parents' cars. So there is an awful lot of traffic in the morning. And uh, the progress that's been made is, is appreciated. We wanted to note that... Um, crosswalks did get repainted. Um, there were some other safety improvements that were discussed. And um, if there's any update on that, that would be great. But thank, thank you for making progress on that project. Thank you. And, and Phil, could we get maybe an update next week, or I should say, I'm sorry, the next meeting on on the Gay Street and any of the additional improvements and when they're either, are they on schedule? I'd have to follow up with our operations staff. We had met with uh, several residents out several months ago and I know we had we had talked in, and gotten on the restriping of some of the crosswalks. I think some of the other walks were, were and some signing was supposed to be adjusted. Um, those are the only improvements I'm aware of. 
um, in that area uh, other than the Third Avenue work that we'll be showing you shortly. Um, but we'll, we'll double check. I think in my last drive through there, we had wanted uh, one of the mid-block crosswalks uh, touched up, and I don't know that that ever happened. And I think some of the signing, uh, we are also changing one of the school zones to make it uh, longer. Um, so I'd have to see where our operations group is with that. But I can provide, we can certainly provide an update the, the next meeting. And also as a follow-up for the other comments for Lonnie, if we could look into, I know Vision Zero, we've talked about road diets and some of the things that can be done. Uh, maybe what we could do is just make a note to see what we're addressing on Main Street in regards to the plan. Because obviously that's an important thoroughfare. That was the, uh, I guess that was my timer, right? Yeah. <laughs> and, and then Benjamin's comments on EV. Um, it's well put, and we understand that, uh, and there is a balance. I know that we've had a conversation about Vision Zero or the EV plan as it relates to that. Um, so that's all I can add in regards to that. Welcome, Council Member Yarborough. <laughs> Well, we're we're on we're on uh, zero, or we don't have a quorum tonight, so we're informational. Yeah, so 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 no voting. <laughs> All right, um, no other public comments. I think we'll jump to the information items, and of course, as we said, they're just information items. We won't be making any votes. Great. Good evening again, Phil Greenwald. Um, just wanted to go through your packet. You did mention last time that you wanted to see an update to the. To the work plan so that is a very quick item where we're just showing you that we didn't take your uh, suggestions into into the from the record into the actual work plans on the basically third to last page of your packet I can show that here as well So you'll see the two highlights where we made the changes to the, your requested changes to that work plan. I just want to make sure you're aware of that so it didn't go unchecked. Um, I think if it's okay with the chair, I will skip over to Vision Zero real quick before we could do the Third Avenue because the Third Avenue is a more of a work plan. We're going to go to the back tables and actually stand around. Okay. Yes, yeah, so we're going to put Third Avenue at the end if that's okay with the chair. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. So just to chat a little bit about Vision Zero, we do have a resolution uh, getting ready to go to City Council. We want to make sure it's tight tightened up before it does go to Council. So um, one item is that we'd like to bring it to you first. So we'd like to bring that to your April meeting and make sure it works for you and then we'll basically be going the next day to city council with it. So it's gonna be a little tight, uh, but we would like to take whatever recommendations you have to the city council at that same time and just make sure they're aware of any conditions or concerns you might have. Or if you wanna recommend that they approve it as is, uh, that's a possibility as well. But we, we wanna just make sure that we're at that level when we go. So that'll be your April meeting where we do that. Again, it's... Uh, it's in pretty good shape, but we need another. Uh, we need we need some time to work with it because it's 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 pretty integrated right now with everything that Vision Zero does, and we really want to make it City of Longmont's Vision Zero. So Vision Zero has not been adopted by any city council um, action as of yet. They just did give us the go ahead to start working on uh, this resolution, and. Uh, that we'll talk about an action plan as far as Vision Zero goes. So just to give you a heads up there. And then we'll move on to the, oh, are there any questions with that? And we'll move on to the 2024 budget discussion. That's that last page in your packet that we sent out a uh, day after the packet went out. And I'll turn it over to Jim Engstead. Oh. 
So what, um, get this up here. Um, thank you, Phil. Um, what we've, we've provided is, is the list of uh, projects that we are or have been working on or, or looking to fund in future years. Um, and they're, they're comprised, we broke them down into several categories. One is asset management. Um, one is the, kind of the leveraged funding projects, leveraged funding meaning we've gotten grants for those projects, which has helped uh, to uh, basically stretch our city match dollars. Um, and then some safety capacity and alternative mo modes um, projects. W one, um, one of the challenges we're facing this year is that um, with the, uh, over the last, I'm gonna say year and a half, um, we face some severe challenges in terms of increasing costs for most of our projects. Um, and most of those projects are most of the more complicated ones. And we've, we've seen it across the boards, not just streets, but um, we have an expansion of the water plant planned and that has, the cost of that has um, nearly doubled from our original estimates. Um, um, so, you know, currently we're working on the um, a project that's tied to the uh, Resilient St. Verain project. That project is Boston Avenue Bridge. That project came in at a, a little over $12 million and we have about $8 million in, in the budget right now. So we're looking to, how are we gonna fund that? Um, we've got some priorities that are, are already been approved by council that we're looking at. Railroad quiet zones is an example. Uh, that was approved by council several years ago and given us the direction to move forward. That is one of the leveraged funding projects wherein we got um, basically almost 50% of the then budget uh, in a grant from FRA. Uh, so we got $4 million for an $8 million project. That's now looking more along the lines of a $10 million project. So what we're looking at in, some, in terms of some of our budgeting is some of these projects will stretch out longer. Uh, quiet zones was one that was broken into components and we were able to spread it out over several years in part because a majority of the work is being done by BNSF, the rail line that owns the railroad and spreading that out, we couldn't do all 17 crossings in one summer, so to speak. We, we don't have the capacity nor do they. Um, so, um, we just wanted to go through some of these, kind of some of the projects so you understand kind of what the critical nature of some of these. Um, our TRRP001, um, the only real good news I can, I can express to everybody is that we bid out this year's uh, pavement rehab contract uh, or contracts, which is comprised of basically our asphalt rehab where we, we repave roads, our concrete rehab. Um, and then uh, we also do a chip seal program where, which will extend the life of, of asphalt. Um, all three of those bids came in, contracts, separate, separate bid items came in within budget. That's the only good news I can, can offer up. Most of our other projects are over. Um, so um, we've got a couple of projects. In, and as I said, we're looking at these, this is over, when we look at a budget over a five year period. Um, an example will be the uh, TRP114, which is the Bowen Left Hand Creek Bridge. Um, we have two bridges um, in our uh, inventory that are um, starting to see wear and tear effects um, long term. So we're starting to program those in. Um, the TRP119, which is the Third Avenue westbound, um, we've been looking to get that into the budget to, to um, basically rehab the deck. Uh, we've done a number of repairs um, on it, but it is reaching the, the tail end of its useful life. Um, the fortunate good news is, is there seems to be within the infrastructure bills some, um, some dollars programmed in for bridges. We're waiting for that to be released so we can at least apply for, for bridge grants. So as we, we look at these and start programming them in long term, we start looking at, at the, the ability to leverage our dollars as well. Um, some of the other projects, TRP 011, um, that is our, um, what we call our, our transportation system management kind of list of projects. So we, we throw a lot of projects in there. Um, several of those, uh, that includes some of our smaller scale safety projects. We throw money, that's where we afford, take out for any new traffic signals. Um, we've got two projects in there that have leveraged dollars. Um, and it looks like some of the, the county line road portion of that is gonna be funded significantly with, with leveraged dollars. So the city's match are smaller. Um, 
so you know, going over some of the cr more critical projects that, that uh, the city manager's office has, has indicated we will fund um, Kaufman Street busway improvements, which is tied to our first in Maine improvements. That one is it's at the top of the list. Um, I already indicated railroad quiet zones is at the top of the list. Um, so as we we prepare and plan that budget, um, we're going to be in, in um, working towards um, some of those priority projects, making sure we have adequate funding. That's going to push some other things out and list them as that either unfunded or push them out in future years. Jim, um, quick question. In regards to the price increases, are you seeing that as a long-term? Is it a short-term thing? Because obviously we're building budgets that sometimes go three to five years. So is this something that you're going to have to plan for in subsequent budget years? I'm, I'm going to say yes. I don't know that we've, we've got models that, that go out five years for that, but we'll look at the first initial two years and hope that prices either flatten out or in some cases will drop. Um, you know, we haven't seen necessarily that, that uh, in the supply chain kind of issues. Um, you know, we're, we're facing it. We're not the only, uh, I guess, uh, Public Works is not the only entity, LPC seeing it cost increases, as well as they're still seeing delays in getting some of their transformers and supplies year, two years out. Um, we're, we're also seeing, in, in some cases, some of our, our development applications are starting to slow down. So the higher interest rates are affecting the ability for developers to get money. So we're seeing um, a little bit of that. I'm going to say we're looking at it. We'll look at it. You know, we budget every year. We do our budget process every year. We'll adjust accordingly in, in 2024 when we budget for 2025. Um, I'm going to assume at least two years of this is what I'll, I would say based on my experience with this type of market uh, change. Material. That's a really great question. Um, we're seeing it in materials, certainly. Um, scarcity in materials. Um, we're also seeing it in labor costs, uh, at least particularly on the front range. Um, you know, what I always say is, is you, you drive up and down the front range, um, you'll, you'll see development everywhere. So labor is a challenge. Um, getting some of our, our, our consultants to provide um, or, or hit our, our, our goals for, for providing, you know, 60, 90, 100% plans seem to get stretched out. They're extremely busy. Um, so labor has been a challenge. Um, it's been reflected across the board on, you know, anywhere in the city. We've had, we have trouble filling positions, particularly at the, at the mid-management and higher levels. Um, some of the we can we can fill engineering positions for kids coming out of college or two or three years experience, but um, mid level and up is very difficult. Um, and we're seeing that in the labor trades as well. Um, and that's part of the challenge is is that um, when we we bid out a project, consultant or contractors just really aren't hungry that they're going to try to lower their prices to get a project. They've got a not, lots of work uh, everywhere along the front range. So just the, I guess, touching real quick on the last topic, the safety capacity and alternative modes project. Um, some of these projects, as, as we go, we'll, we'll see their budgets reduced, um, some dollars shift around. Um, some projects we're, we're trying to fund, we, we've got, uh, other than the street fund, we do have some um, money coming in on some of our trail projects from other areas. Um, Example would be the Spring Gulch Number Two project that really actually isn't listed here because we're it's already in the existing budget and we're working to get that trail completed. Dollars from that are coming in not just from from streets, but also from other areas of um, we've got uh, some park dollars uh, because it isn't running through open space as well. So we we look to leverage our dollars not just with outside money but with an interior. As well, there's also um, some of the Hover Street improvements, maybe the Nelson Road 
um, and Hover Street intersections we're looking to fund with the Transportation Community Investment Fee Fund, um, which is used for capacity. That is the money that developers put into a fund that goes to capacities or capacity improvements. So where we have those, we're looking to use those dollars um, on some of these projects. So we'll, we will see some of them funded, um, but it's gonna be a very tight budget year, so. So with that, we just wanted to, oh, go ahead. Uh, so Jim, um, spe especially in the context that Vision Zero is going to happen, um, I trust council will pass the resolution and then we'll work on an action plan. And a lot of Vision Zero is about, you know, uh, narrowing lanes. And, and these projects, there's quite a few, at least when I read the descriptions, there's a lot of, you know, add another lane, uh, even the Nelson one I read, uh, add a lane or add a, a width for a bike lane. Um, but then under Vision Zero, you're, I'm looking at speed control separation, um, you know, a, a, a cyclist on a 35 mile an hour road um, that probably traditionally goes 40. Um, I don't want them to get hit. So I'm just wondering, can we also maybe get rid of some of these projects um, at least lessen them to a degree, especially like the Hover widening, uh, Nelson widening. Um, I know that doesn't involve the intersection, but at least maybe we could think of alternative ways and, and extremely focus on our multimodal plan to really get people on a different path than a two-ton car that can hit people, so. So what I'll note is, well, well we do a lot of talking about Vision Zero. Okay, so Vision Zero is, is we're not gonna accomplish that in a year or two years. We're gonna put a, a goal in of, of several years out. So we, we need to take, take a long-term approach, long-term thinking. Um, and you know, currently within the, I think the existing budget, we're gonna see about 60 to $80 million of unfunded projects. Some of these projects will slide into that and, and may never resurface again. So uh, as part of, of looking at Vision Zero, as Phil takes on a, a transportation, what do we call it, mobility plan, um, those are items we'll, we'll, we'll be looking at a lot harder. Um, I know that council has, has made indications of, of pushing more multimodal um, thought processes. So I think uh, there's, there's a, I guess the best I could come up with, yeah, maybe, an answer of some of these projects dropping off. Um, we, we would see that. And, and what I want, would also want to just remind everybody, the, these are the capital projects we look at. Look at. Um, a lot of, of, of most of what you're going to see with Vision Zero, of at least the planning components, are going to come out of the operating budget. And that is, that is a, a, a separate budget, separate kind of to a certain degree budget process uh, where we look at. Um, that's where we maintain our signals. Some of our smaller scale safety projects are funded out of there. Our concrete rehab where we would do small scale safety improvements of like curb extensions comes out of our, our um, some of that operating dollars. So um, I would say, you know, we're, we're, this is the first time I think we've, we've brought tab in early on in the budget process. So I think those are the discussions we can have as we move through the process. Yeah, well, yeah, I just remember the, the Vision Zero study session of city manager saying, you know, immediately we need to start looking at projects and maybe the where we plan on widening roads, maybe we need to narrow the roads. Um, and then I advocate is thinking about other other modes of travel, including maybe a like for Hover, for the future BRT, I'm like, well, why not a protected bus lane um, to fully separate and speed up alternative modes of travel? Thanks for your comments. The reason for this to be on your agenda tonight is really for more dis any more discussion. So if we, we would just open it up. If these projects look like, um, you know, if they look acceptable, these are the, well, these are the projects that we're putting into the budget, but we'd like to hear some conversation about it. And I think the Vision Zero piece is exactly what we are looking for as far as how do we, because really what's gonna happen, and I was gonna mention this at the end, is we're gonna have this transportation mobility plan and Vision Zero going parallel tracks. 
and they're going to feather into each other at the end of each. So uh, those will have to come together and, and be part of the solution for all the things that you were talking about, uh, Board Member Wickham. So um, those are the kind of things we're looking for. Is this the idea about widening roads? I think City Council's heard a lot about th those discussions and, and where we are with, uh, if you look at certain projects that have been done recently, like Ninth Avenue west of Main Street, well, west of Kaufman, uh, that's where we had an operation project, operational project that went back in and restriped that differently uh, and provided a buffered bike lane where there was none before and a center turn lane where there was none before. So safety for all, all modes is really our key here and then maintaining the existing system so that we don't fall into disrepair and have a very expensive project uh, in the medium term, midterm future. Uh, you'll see the same kind of project on Mountain View. Uh, we did that as well. Parking was removed in some instances, on-street parking, much to the chagrin of some of the neighbors, but I think now uh, there's an understanding that that's a safer, safer condition overall. So again, safety, taking care of the road, and then safety for all modes as well. So um, there's some other things we'd like to talk to you about as far as getting people out of their vehicles in the long, tr in the long run. That's a future discussion item we'll probably have um, as we get further into the year. Uh, as far as uh, what we're ex I'm excited about is micro uh, transit. Uh, so we're gonna see how we do as far as going for some federal dollars there. And uh, we should be able to let you know uh, more about that in about two months. So those are the things that we're working on, but going over these projects would be, uh, we just wanna make sure there's either kind of head nodding or, if, or are we missing something here just to get your general sense of kind of where we're, are we on the right track? Uh, as a follow-up to uh, board member Wickland's comments, uh, Phil, I know you and Jim have been through a lot of these budget cycles and planning cycles. My question is, how long does it take for a concept like Vision Zero or microtransit to go from an idea to actually showing up as projects on a list like the one we're looking at tonight? Are we talking, would you say three years, four years? I think the answer is it depends. Typically when it's a capital project, if it's a smaller capital project, it's more of a three year time frame. but most of the things that I'm working with in a more of a long-term transportation planning role is the bigger projects and those are at least five years uh, to, in discussion and usually more. So, um, but five years is kind of that um, a threshold. With microtransit, that's an idea about getting money, uh, most likely grant dollars to help us start that program up, a startup, and then working with RTD and partnership. So there's a lot of different folks to work with on that. That's a public-private partnership model. So there's a lot of folks to work with in that, but it can go fairly fast if everybody can kind of come on board, but it really requires chasing the money. That's gonna take, I mean, we've, I've been doing this uh, for about a year and a half now. So that's where we are and we're hoping to have more news, like I said, by the end of uh, this spring, early, well, probably more like early summer. So that'll tell us if we have money, if we don't, it's kind of where do we go to the next pot of money to chase? So, yeah, it depends, sorry. Just real quick, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, in regards to the projects that we have on the list here, I, I get it's a balancing act. We have to take care of some things on an immediate level. And so Vision Zero, from what I understand, is almost philosophical or it's an umbrella with which we would operate in terms of design, design principles for the things that we're doing going forward. So with that being said, and kind of tie in with, with what um, I was gonna say council member, but board member McInerney, good luck on you, right? Um, was, was gonna say is, is, you know, with that idea of Vision Zero being a design principle, do you s suspect that residents are gonna see a change to some of this? Because we've already had some comments tonight about it in support of Vision Zero. And I'd like to know that we're really progressing there that folks are gonna see that. So that was long-winded, but. Well, I, 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 I don't wanna categorize Vision Zero as a, as, a, as a design 
kind of uh, solution through design, so so to speak. Uh, Vision Zero is is that is one component of it. It is it is also one of the other components is a is a, a rather uh, um, I want to say detailed, involved, rather large public engagement process where you bring the stakeholders together um, as part of of not just the um, it, you start with the creation of the the action plan that brings those stakeholders together, okay, to create the action plan, and then after, once the plan is is basically created and then implemented, you begin to implement it. Then you still have that engagement across across the boards, and there's a number of, of other things in, in regards to equity, in regards to uh, kind of some of the, the the options you can do in regards to the speed limits, and uh, but infrastructure improvements are only one uh, one small part of it. Um, and, and uh, you know, part of, from the city's perspective, um, you know, getting to a zero deaths is going to be very challenging, okay? We will probably have better success in limiting or reducing some of the more, um, not fatal crashes, but, but the, the higher injury crashes. The, the challenge in regards to zero deaths is that most of those uh, deaths happen on uh, the arterial roads with higher speeds. Um, so that, that's something we'll, we'll, we'll have to, to see. And there's not a, you know, some of those areas, um, some of the fatalities we had are, are on state roadways out of our control. Um, so it'll be a challenge, but I, I think those are things that's part of the, what we have to bring everybody together to discuss as part of the action plan as we start cra crafting that over the next year. And as we spoke with the council at the retreat on Saturday, we we should aspire to zero deaths on our roadways, whether they're state or local or whatever, but that's our aspirational goal is to meet that zero, well, that zero death. So we don't want to say we're trying to, you know, get to a number, the number is zero because every one of those is a, is a, is a person. So that's, that's the kind of goals of vision zero. Um, <clears throat> um, well, I, I, I totally understand that because Vision Zero, you know, started in Sweden and they're still working on it 30 years later. Um, it just took us 30 years to get it over, over here. Um, but I would, I would disagree that because it, like to quote, um, unfortunately I don't have his name, a uh, Boston professor, but just the five principles of Vision Zero, uh, speed control separation, functional harmony. So meaning roads should not or should avoid multiple functions. Um, predictability, simplicity, forgivingness, restrictiveness. So when you make a mistake, it's not deadly. Uh, state awareness. So so I would I would argue that it's very much a design um, um, issue, not just enforcement and educating the public. It's all that as well. But then it's also how we how we build things and and maybe how we perfect our road diets. Uh, to a achieve separation for all users, but then also to maybe slow speeds and get drivers to pay attention. So, just that. well, we appreciate your comments and thank you very much. We'll take those into consideration as we move forward in this next budget cycle. So, I appreciate your time on that. The last thing we have, if that's all for this budget item is more of a work plan and that you can invite all the public as well to kind of go around the table in the back. We're gonna roll, unroll this roll plot. Oh, go ahead. Uh, uh, just a, a follow up on the Kaufman Street. So that will be fully funded is what I heard. That has been our direction okay. uh, that we anticipate funding that project. Okay. So we are looking, currently we are at, at um, 90 percent plans I believe um, we're working through some property acquisition um, some easements uh, it is uh, because it is a leverage project leverage with federal funding we have to go through the federal process so it takes a little longer uh, to procure the easements uh, yeah. through the federal process so we've put that into schedule anticipating that we will be going out to bid November December of this year um, awarding in January of next year um, and then getting started in uh, March, April, the spring 
Um, the, currently, uh, we are getting ready for that. Um, there is currently a water line project mm -hmm. that we are wrapping up that will get the water line out of the way uh, um, of the, any of the other improvements. So that project is, is actually beginning. Uh, so you will see construction activity on Kaufman this summer. Um, but Kaufman is one of the projects that we have, have indicated uh, will be funded. And we are looking currently, as we go into the next budget cycle, of um, providing a pretty hefty contingency within the budget, anticipating if costs continue to go up, we will have it covered. We won't have to be kind of doing an exercise of trying to find dollars uh, in the budget. So we're looking at like a 20% increase in, uh, as well as other contingencies. So we will be be looking at we anticipating increases as we budget for next year. Okay, and then uh, I guess this might be for Phil. Is you know the, the, this is more like lo looking at the the future. Uh, you know, let's dream about the future. And uh, after Kaufman, uh, because it it will be, you know, our first uh, priority bus lanes, uh, protected uh, cycleway, um, but also people have to get there. To, to use those facilities. So what's what's the dream to connect it um, in the future? Great question and a lot of dreaming going on. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> the, the, the goal is to get people to this station. Microtransit's one part of that goal. It, it's basically in a, a vision of, of five smaller vans that would just kind of trek around town. The, the goal of that program of microtransit is uh, is stated as uh, less than a 15 minute wait after you make a call or, or or whether you're calling whether you're using your phone however you're doing it we're trying to bring a lot of equity into this so it's not you don't need to necessarily um, I mean it's going to be a multi-language phone call that you can I mean you'll have a translator on the other end that can speak a variety of languages so we're trying to make it so it's all inclusive and make sure that uh, it's very equitable. Anybody can use it, call in. Within 15 minutes, you'll have a, a place to catch the ride. It may not be in front of your house, like an Uber or Lyft, but it may be two blocks away, one or two blocks away. So you'll meet up with maybe one or two other people who would also share that ride with you, so it, like a bus still. And so within 15 minutes, you would catch the, the, the shuttle and 15 minutes, you would be at your destination. So it's less than 30 minute trip total for anybody in the city using that system. So that's the vision. We'll see, you know, that's the, that's the scope we'll put out there for folks as we bid out this project, just like we bid out um, a construction project. The other piece is we're working, with the, uh, we're working with folks in the whole Northwest region that includes, that's the Northwest Denver area region. We're working on it and now getting Expanding the B-cycle, electric bicycle, B-cycle, bike share system in Boulder to be countywide and maybe even into parts of uh, Westminster and Broomfield County or Westminster's in Adams County, Broomfield and Broomfield County. So we're trying to incorporate and expand that system so that we could have electric bikes that would help make those, those connections as well. And then we'll have the RTD bus system still on top of that. We're thinking micromobility may be able to offset a lot of that. So bring RTD in as a partner to help fund the micromobility model. So again, a lot of dreams going on, but this is all hubbed at first in Maine. And the other piece of it is to start talking about Kaufman Street being this bus corridor. And you've heard some from somebody who lives along that corridor, but also is, is, has the other portion of that corridor is on Main Street. So we're looking and working with the LDDA, the Long Longmont Downtown Development Authority, to figure out what to do with Main Street next. And there was a lot of excitement. Uh, you know, unfortunately it was driven by COVID, but there was a lot of excitement when we uh, narrowed that down to one lane in each direction. So there's a thought of how do you make that more of a permanent um, slowing traffic and cha changing the lanes into, you know, bicycle facilities, or do you expand the sidewalk? Some would argue that there's enough sidewalk on Main Street right now to handle the pedestrian load. But I think if you go out there on any given evening, especially as we're getting the longer hours. And if you go out there on a, on a weekend, you'll see a lot of pedestrian traffic using <laughs> Main Street. As uncomfortable as it is, I think people are, are drawn to that area and it's just the center of, of Longmont. So all these things play into each other. 
uh, we'll still be driving. We're not trying to get people to abandon their cars necessarily, but if, if we can offer that, that goes into some of the affordable housing and attainable housing aspects. That takes a, a large cost load off of people trying to afford housing in Longmont. So it all plays into each other and it's all working together. So I'm getting on my soapbox now, so I'll, I'll leave that and let you speak. It, just one follow up, Phil, is uh, so then also what about like local cyclists getting to the facility instead of using a B cycle? And then, and then just to tie in another question is uh, maintenance, because I, I remember one of the bike issues committee, like when there was the Pike Road uh, bollards placed in as an experiment, one of the big complaints was, you know, rock and gravel couldn't be swept. So are we planning to expand our maintenance equipment to even take care of these facilities? A great question. What we're doing is we're working with our maintenance group as we bring these projects forward and making sure they're fully involved in the project so that they understand what we're looking to construct and we're meeting their needs for what kind of equipment they have or what kind of equipment they can get to make this, to make it work better than what we did on Pike Road, which was to quickly install some bollards to, as a test. And we quickly learned from our maintenance crews that it was too narrow and it didn't, it didn't work. It was we're really trying to squeeze something into, into that shoehorn it in that wasn't meant to be shoehorned in that way with, with the existing travel lanes. Um, and the other part of your question was how to get there on a bicycle if you're not e-bicycle. Yeah, so, so I'm just thinking of like the future of, you know, this is our first protected bike lane. Hopefully it's not our last. So um, right. and start and, planning for the next one. So. And that'll connect directly to the St. Brain Greenway okay. on the south. So it'll have a direct connection. It'll actually be a great connection from St. Vrain Greenway north into downtown on Kaufman Street for bicycles and, and walkers and people using other wheeled devices so it, it should be it should be um, very multimodal and as you get into the station area at first and main first and kaufman uh, between boston and, and and first there uh, the idea is that that's got some parking involved with it it's going to have bicycle parking bicycle lockers so you should have a secured place to park your vehicle and your vehicle <laughs> your bicycle vehicle and your and your automobile so um and then there'll be obviously lots of loading and unloading opportunities there too. So for kiss and ride opportunities, carpooling opportunities, those kind of things, um, that'll be accommodated as well. So we're really trying to connect it and it will be dynamic in that it can grow. And if it's not done right on opening day, we can, we can, we can adapt to other conditions and other transportation modes we don't even understand right now, so. I guess before we do the session in the back, do we want to allow, make a change, and Stacy, you can correct me, to let the rest of the public make comments and then move to that? Or should we wait till we've gone through that and then have public make comments? I mean, Phil, what are you thinking how long it's going to take for us to do the session up there? 20 minutes, 30 minutes. Okay. Why well, just and then figured we can reconvene? <clears throat> What's that now? And then reconvene after that? Yeah, yeah. I just didn't know we had more public show up, so it's up to you if you'd like to just invite anybody who hasn't spoken and who might not want to be part of the Third Avenue work work study here. That uh, you may want to just let them speak and then be able to leave if they'd like. Or, yeah, and they're f certainly welcome if you if you allow it to. Uh, be part of that work study in the back. Yeah, work, that's work fine. Session. So if anybody in the public would like to come up and speak, we would open up the, the days for you if you don't want to be part of the Third Street uh, budget conversation. If not, you can stick around. Okay, no, that's fine. We'll go ahead and do the, the Third Street uh, budget conversation. So. I'm sorry, do we have a taker? Yeah. Uh, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. 
Hi, my name is Martha Goble. I am from um, Gay Street, the 700 block of Gay. And we were just, um, a couple of us came today to just learn a little bit more about what the traffic mitigation and speed mitigation would be happening for the Gay Street Longs Peak area. There's been many accidents at that intersection. It's just a two way people kind of use Gay Street as a th thoroughfare because it does go from 66 down to price. Um, and uh, I just, <laughs> sorry, I, I haven't done public speaking much. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> but we just wanted to know, I know that there's been some plans. I know one of our neighbors has been speak, speaking with Phil, I believe um, Haley Tripfire about some of the, we have emails about <laughs> what was going to be going on with uh, Gay Street and what the plans were for Gay Street and Long's Peak area. Um, there were a couple different things for slowing down traffic and I wasn't sure if that was in the budget or if that was in the plans. I think it was a phase one. Um, so they weren't gonna do I'm going to step off and let Ed speak. <laughs> I don't know if I'll do any better. I think specifically our concerns were, it seemed like there was going to be a dramatic change to, you know, the, the, the infrastructure on our street, getting rid of parking on the east side of the street, which I read was anecdotally, there's not a parking problem on Gay Street. Well, if you've ever been near our street on any day that there's anything going on at the park, or God forbid there's a parade. It's mayhem. I mean, it feels unsafe, and people still block my driveway. I mean, they're, I mean they not encroach on it, but block the driveway. Um, I know that's probably, what, five, ten times a year, but if you live there, it's not to be completely, you know, discounted. Um, it feels kind of crazy on those days. Um, I, re I was also curious, because we were, you know, 19 foot, we were looking at some of the plans, and I'm like, how much of my front yard is going towards this plan? So that was just something I, you know, wanted to check in on and see if there was any discussion of that tonight. But that, um, no, please be aware that uh, we and our neighbors are, are very interested and very aware and will be paying attention and um, hopefully, you know, be able to be a sounding board for the people that live there, you know. Thank you for your time. Thank you for that. Anyone else? If not, we can go, I think, to the back and do the, yes, Jim. So um, one of the previous tab meetings we were asked to bring back um, and provide you information on Third Avenue. So, um, um, that is our intention tonight. This is uh, kind of a precursor to a public meeting that we will be held uh, kind of on, on April April 6th. So to move things along, you know, we'll accept questions, um, comments from the board, um, but there will be an opportunity for the general public to offer up those comments at the April 6th meeting. And those invites should be going out by the end of this week. Um, we are finalizing the list and the letter as we kind of in, in the next coming days, uh, so we will get those mailed out. So um, I'd be happy to uh, answer any questions, but I don't want to get, again, get into a lot of conversation with the public where we're going to unveil this again. Um, this is a, a plan that is, it is in its final stages, so there are a couple opportunities to tweak a few things. Uh, but generally, this is a kind of a, a, the low-cost measure we can do. Um, one of the things you will not see on this plan is any bike lanes. Um, to install bike lanes would require whole-scale removal of parking in a number of areas and widening of the road. And we are, that was never our intention. Um, so um, I will, you know, be happy to show you kind of the graphic we have. Uh, this will be a very similar graphic to what we're going to show um, on April 6th as well. Um, this is a second of a public meeting, series of public meetings where we heard a number of, of, of issues with the public that, that asked us for a few things, uh, a number of things, and um, that's really kind of our intention is to get back 
uh, back to the unveil, kind of where we're we're taking the corridor to show how we can we can control um, kind of that speed. Um, it is uh, for the most quarter twenty five miles per hour. Um, so we're going to be doing a, a number of, of kind of non-invasive improvements, um, some traffic control with stop signs, uh, crossing marks, markings, uh, some more flashing radars. That is really what we're, we're, we're going to be showing here, narrowing lanes down to nine and a half to 10 foot lanes to, to kind of help to slow, um, slow traffic down. So that's what we'll show you. Phil? Um I'm sorry, I just wanted to uh, ask on the Gay Street, if we could also, I know we talked about the near the elementary school with the crosswalks, but also look at uh, some of the comments a little farther south on there. Maybe just a discussion item on Gay Street next meeting or the meeting after, because it sounds like we might have two things that we at least ought to be aware of. Right, and just a quick little follow up on Gay Street, based on the last comment that, that was just made, a lot of those design pieces or those uh, really preliminary design, it's not even design, it was just a, it was just what could happen, what could fit. It was part of the um, enhanced multi-use corridor planning or EMUC planning that was done a number of years ago. And we've since learned through, through a lot of uh, trial and error and trying to get this just, you know, done it right and within a budget is we probably aren't gonna be able to move curbs as much as a consultant who, who did that project thought we could move curbs and, and we just don't, as you've heard throughout this discussion, the resources are not there to do those kind of uh, um, larger elemental changes that we, we, we just don't have the resources to do that. So we've been trying to work within the curb line. So people who are concerned about a plan that they saw called enhanced multi-use corridor planning and they saw their their street widened, and they saw uh, portions of their, you know, their their tree lawn taken away. That's not going to happen with what we've got going as far as any kind of budget we have right now. And the other piece of it is we're going to take the EMUC plan, and it's going to get absorbed into the transportation mobility plan that we've got planned for later this year. So we will incorporate that into the TMP and we will make those modifications based on what we've heard from the public, and this isn't the first time we've heard these concerns. So we appreciate that the people are coming out and talking about these things, because it's giving us a clear direction forward. Thank you. And I was gonna say, too, for this Third Avenue piece, I'm concerned because uh, Longmont, Pub Longmont Pub Public Media is in the house, and they'd probably like to be able to see what's going on. So I'm gonna bring the mic with us so they can hear us, and it would be great if we could I'm not sure which, um, maybe this front table here would be the best place. And if we can kind of maybe go behind and let uh, LPM see what we're doing so we can keep this as a public meeting that's actually uh, useful for people as they rewatch it. So no, that sounds appropriate, yeah. Oh, okay, so we're gonna, have, <laughs> we're gonna have to do some table extension maybe, but uh, I'm trying to figure out where else we could do this. Um, but maybe it's worth a short recess as we move tables into position. Okay, we'll take a short recess to get some tables in position. Okay, I'm hoping this works. Great. So we are gonna have to do this in the back of the room. We apologize to people watching um, later on <laughs> for this discussion, but we are going to uh, try to get all the verbal pieces of this we can. Sixth meeting. April sixth meeting. Okay.
Well, we thought this was going to be more interactive. <laughs> and so kind of see what's going on. Yeah, so what we've done is we've unrolled the, the, the plot. We wanted to do this. We'll do that on PowerPoint on April 6th, so you'll get another view of this. This isn't the last time you'll see this. Uh, we'll take it through the whole entire process as well. So I'm going to let Jim kind of walk through the plan here and give him the mic. Goody. I, get to, I get to talk here. All right. I guess, is this thing on? I guess I got to really talk close. All right. Um, so um, to my left, your right, looking at this uh, main street is on this side. So we're looking and going to start talking about the improvements moving from east to west. Um, so um, we are, uh, this is one of the final drafts. We are still looking at some minor um, lane adjustments in and around Third um, Avenue and Kaufman. Um, it is a signalized intersection uh, in conjunction with the Kaufman Widening Project. We're looking at, at some lane, a lane adjustment there. Um, as we start to move towards Pratt, we are looking at um, adjustments to the uh, narrowing up the, um, the crosswalks, providing a um, basically a uh, Crosswalk markings, we're necking down the roadway. Thank you, Phil. Um, we're providing a safe haven. Um, there's going to be, uh, what gets lost in here is there is a curb extension on the south side. Uh, so um, we'll provide, but then we're gonna be putting in uh, our normal crosswalks and crosswalk signage um, on both sides, both, um, both sides of Pratt Street. Um, one of the uh, analysis we did over the, the last year was doing some counts and measuring of pedestrians, and we found that pedestrians were using both sides of the, of the roadway for crossing, uh, not just pushing to one side. So we felt that we needed to, to continue that, um, so providing those ability to cross, uh, but narrowing up the, the exposed area where a pedestrian would be crossing uh, on the roadway. Um, providing some markings on the road to indicate that there is a crosswalk there as well as the crosswalk markings. Um, continuing to go uh, towards the west, um, we are proposing um, some additional uh, striping improvements, cleaning up the striping at Gay Street. Um, that is already, I believe, a, um, a four-way stop, uh, but we'll be enhancing those crossings and um, putting in new reflective stop signs. Um, we are working um, on Bowen Street. We are um, also looking at providing additional um, cleaning up the crossings, cleaning up the signs, providing um, some yield signs to pedestrians, as well as uh, additional warning signs, um, noting that there is a crosswalk there uh, so that they should be yielding to, to pedestrians as they are in the crosswalk. Um, hawk signal. Um, hawk signals are usually what we see for pedestrian movements at um, mid-block crossings as well as the RRFBs. We were looking at those on several of the intersections, RRFBs, but found that. Please make sure your questions are on the mic so I can hear them. Um, Um, was there uh, any accounting for, uh, I call it Hawkeye, sorry, Hawk signals. I know that those are normally mid-block accommodations, but I know with 3rd Street and kind of the nature of it, if, if that would have made sense. And um, we did look at, at our RFBs at several intersections, but we didn't look at any Hawk signals. We were, we were, uh, we're not seeing that those would be the best use to provide some of the crossings. Um, so we moving a little further up, we are um, putting in um, some of our flashing or, or uh, our radar uh, speed limit signs. Um, we are also, um, some of the new um, signs we are buying will be data collection systems. So we will be able to identify um, both the number of cars, counts of cars, as well as get data on, on speeds of, of cars throughout here. Um, we recently, uh, in conjunction with public safety, bought them um, 
several of those signs that are actually uh, um, portable signs where they can strap them to a pole. We're going to actually install uh, permanent signs here for so we have those at this location. Um, then moving on. Oh wait, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, Jim, quick question. I guess this one works too. On on the um, <coughs> excuse me on the signs that show the speed limit because I know Mountain View has them. A couple other streets. Have there been any data collected after the fact that shows? whether you're getting more compliance with, with speeds? Because I know that's very difficult to kind of gauge based on those are really just signs that are showing speed. They're not really doing anything for so compliance. So as, as we, we move, kind of move forward in the future, that's kind of what our intention is as we install some of these facilities is, is the ability with, with some of those temporary signs, the flashing ones, to build a database of uh, what's the problem. And that, that's one of the components of, of Vision Zero is that is a is data collection across kind of the city that starts to identify where some of the problems are. That's one of the reasons public safety wanted some of these signs. They want to start identifying where people are speeding, that they can put you know their forces to best use. Um, so you know we're looking at this later this year to pick up a few more um, outside of this project. And I want to. I'd have to get back to you, and I'll, I'll finalize this prior to the the next meeting. But I believe we were going to put Bowen as stop control. Entirely, so my graphic is wrong. So I do apologize for that, uh, but I'll have that information for the uh, April 6 meeting uh, verify that. But there was uh, an intersection in there where we were providing stop control. It did warrant a uh, the four-way stop. Um, so moving up, we are um, coming up to Sherman Street. Um, we are looking at curb extensions and um, a four a three-way stop. At, for the northern leg, uh, we have traffic counts or pedestrian counts of a lot of movement um, there, so we want to provide that protective crossing. Um, it's also uh, an intersection at uh, the bend of the road. Uh, has caused a lot of problems with sight distance, so we were looking to provide a, a, a three-way stop. Um, and then we were also, at, from our public meeting there and some of our analysis, there's an access issue for cars coming southbound on Francis to access the corridor. That missed the graphic, and this is the right one. So um, this is a, the blow up. The, the difference with this is we are undertaking a drainage project through here. That's going to be coming hopefully shortly. Um, and there's a lot of utilities in this corridor, so the, that design is, is dragging a little bit. Um, we originally intended to put curb extensions. These will not occur here. Um, simply because of, of the drainage issues and getting the water to drain. Um, but that drainage project will come up here and then go down the alley to an existing pipe um, and tie into an existing pipe just off the alley. And that is that project has to occur before these start um, coming to fruition for, for us to do start doing the concrete work, which is the first thing we'll do as part of the project. Um, continuing on, um, we are going to be putting in a um, making use of these existing um, curb extensions here, putting in a crosswalk at Vivian. Um, there will also be additional signage on that, both, both um, preliminary signs coming at the approach as well as signs at the intersection, and then following up with uh, flashing speed signs again between the two Vivians. As we move down to sunset, we will be uh, restriping the area. Um, the alignment um, based on when we, we came and paved last year, put in bike lanes to the west, um, that uh, kind of caused some issues. So we're going to realign some of the striping, um, re-enhance re re the crosswalks, uh, as well as all the stop signs. Um, this, is a, uh, this intersection is rather challenging. It's one of the, for a four-way stop, um, that gets a, a medium amount of traffic. Um, it's one of our highest crash intersections, so we want to realign this with some, some striping and then some tick marks across the intersection so it lines up. Um, and again, we are, as part of this striping, um, we are going to provide not just a double yellow down the middle, but also um, we're going to kind of note the parking on either side with um, a, a solid white line and provide as much parking as we can. Um, once we kind of establish 
the plan or the, the construction is done, we will, we will basically be going out and re-looking at um, the, the parking areas, revising site distance, checking site distance, um, and making sure it's in compliance with our criteria, uh, anticipating that we are looking to, to maximize some of the parking along the corridor. Um, that is our goal, one of our goals, as well as maintaining uh, the traffic through here and slowing those cars down. Um, and then providing, you know, on, on Sherman, on Vivian, on um, Judson, access onto the corridor. So that's really what we're going to sum this all up. Um, April 6th, I'll be doing this again. Um, and hopefully I'll be better at it. Um, so does any of the board have any questions or? Where does the demand for parking come from? Well, this corridor is actually really challenging. So you've got um, you've got kind of a change in in use. Excuse me. You've got you know a, a commercial kind of entity. You've got some businesses down here. You've got a church. Um, we see parking intermixed intermixed through here. Um, the the parking changes. Some is on the north side. In, in some areas, some is on the south side. As we move kind of towards into the residential area, there's, uh, we see a lot of use on the south side. Actually, no, we don't allow parking on the north side. So we see it through here. Um, we, we have seen it intermittently a little bit through here. Um, there, there is the, the west side tavern. Um, so this gets um, some use. Um, one of the challenges I think that, that started the project is um, when we, we took a look uh, on the site distance on Sherman and Francis, um, we used uh, the most strictest standards um, because of the amount of traffic we saw on the speeds and the sight lines uh, to promote the sight lines. I think part of this project will get us back to our normal standard um, and not uh, because we can, um, with, it'll be a little bit safer to provide it back to the normal standard, not use the most stricted standards. So, um, and then, you know, kind of on the parking, um, on the west side, um, most of the, the homes there uh, on Johnson, they're, they're alley loaded and there's adequate parking on the roads. We don't see as much here um, on the kind of west of Francis, I wanna say. You see it a little bit, but if you drive it, it, it we don't see it significantly. But in, it, it, the parking is intermixed throughout the area where it's needed or where it's wanted. I guess the only, well, I have one question and a comment. Um, these bump outs, are we trying to focus them on every intersection or is there a reason not here, or or is it just not like not we, visually there? We were looking at, at at the intersection of Pratt. If you drive it today, it is very wide, particularly on the east side. So we were looking at, at, at having to desperately do something there. Uh, it is a long way for somebody to walk. Um, most of the other areas, it is it is more reasonable. And and part of the challenge with curb extensions is how do you drain the road? So we're, we're looking at we looked at some of those areas and, and felt it it. With, with some signage, and in this case, at Bowen's gonna be stop control, it wasn't necessarily needed. And I, I think uh, one comment coming from a cyclist, I'm okay with no bikes on third. Uh, I, I, I think, you know, I think spruce or going north on six or fourth is better better option for safety. So, so one of the things we have, I mean, Phil and I have had conversations about, it's nothing official, is that, you know, you look at 4th Avenue um, and it, it is a really kind of a strange corridor. It's got bike lanes on it, but in the area of the park, it's got huge travel lanes as well. So those are areas as, as, we, as we kind of kind of morph into what we're going to be doing on Main Street, what we're we doing on Kaufman, how do we get bikes there? We've had discussions about, hey, do we want to do one-way streets? on those east-west streets and then make, you know, one side of the road uh, a two-way bike lane, okay? One of the challenges with, with, with I, know, I know you love that, that, that separated bike lane, 
Okay, separate it from the road. Put it. Put I a know median it costs in. a lot. Well, well, but one of the challenges is that in so certain areas, you're going to have you have a lot of residential driveways in some areas, and and providing access for that for those driveways. That's one of our challenges. Crosswalks. It's a par massive park there, and there are no crosswalks into it. So that's that's part of what I'm sure you're still working on at the school. The principal will be able to speak to that. <laughs> Jim, when we met um, a few months back regarding <coughs> Central. This you added across, no, you added a crosswalk here, here, sorry, here, here, and you ma painted this one, repainted this one, because currently as this map sits, when it was shot, this was the only I crosswalk <laughs> bordering the entire school. This was the only crosswalk. Um, so there is one here now. There is one here now, and uh, after Tony passed, there is now one here. Um, when you and I spoke, you also had stated or that the stop signs currently are beyond the crosswalk, and there was talk about taking those stop signs and putting them pre-crosswalk, so it makes sense. Um, I had brought up to you that this park is a beautiful park, but it is an attractive nuisance, if you will, because, and I don't mean that in the wrong way, I mean it because the kids use the park after school, and they run across the street, but there's nothing there. There's no, there's no crosswalk. There's nothing there. Now, there is one here that you've added, but it's, it's a draw that these kids run to here, and then we live right here. We have a a great view of everything that goes on at this school. Um, after school, the kids use the playground until it's dark. And, um, you know, as you know, it's a commuter school. There is no busing to Central at all. So everybody that comes to the school, they're biking, skateboarding, skiing, <laughs> you know, uh, their parents are taking them, but they're also running on their own. My main concern is the school and the, due to it being elementary, especially. Yeah, and I, I um, thank you for that. For 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 that, there were there were a number of items I think we had we had talked about and and we're looking at addressing. I think there was a, we wanted to extend this, um, the the school zone. I think up to the point and our operations team, uh, our yep flashing light. We were going to push it to this pole. Our signal team was 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 supposed to have that. Accomplished. That is something I'd have to check up on. I think we were going to relocate the end school zone here yes. down to match with the that flasher. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yep, yeah. and that's got to move. Um, that was what we agreed to. We'll 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 make sure that happens. Um, I I don't I, I drove it. I think last week. I don't think this. We we wanted to have this rehabbed. I don't think I don't think <laughs> did it get rehabbed because it didn't look like it when I I drove it. The, the weather hits it, so, and and I believe that's, these we put in with paint, I thought that was thermo, that should last longer, so, but we'll have it, we'll have, that'll be something we'll, again, in the crosswalk scenario, we'll have them touched up this summer before school. Flashing light, sorry, the flashing light is on, on the, on this side of the street, and then Immediately across the street is the end of school zone. Right, and we would move both. We would, you know, if we would move the, the, the sign. Actually, if it's depending on where that end of school zone is, we'd have to look at it. That was for the flasher down, down here. But we would probably move it back up to the. We would shift around. We'll take a look yeah. at it. Okay, it's you know we'll when, it when I had brought it up to you, it was before school started, and now I think we're going to be through another school year, and it's almost like you know, 
I know when I had met with you both and I said, it's not a matter of when right. or if it's going to happen. It's a matter of when it's going to happen, so, the hit, an accident, and it, and it certainly did happen two weeks later. So one of, one of the things I, I, I will hopefully, you know, is positive news. Um, we, we have a new traffic engineer. Um, that position sat um, when we had spoken. That position hadn't been filled yet. Um, he's, a, he's a younger engineer. He's got a, a lot of different ideas regarding multimodal versus some of our traditional, uh, in the past, we, we've had a kind of, the, the, the goal of traffic engineers is to move traffic, um, and traffic meaning cars. I think we, there, there's a, a change of kind of philosophy both in, in the traffic unit as well as our, our city council in regards to making things safe. So um, we, we, we hear you, uh, we're working on it. Um, we will, um, you know, we, you and I had met out there. We'd, we'd, we'd committed to a few things. We'll make sure they get done. I have a question. Is this on? Okay. I have a question. Um, my children both went to Central Elementary. They are both high school and 21. But why was never, why has Frost never had a school crossing? Because the preschool and kindergarten, the preschool comes out of the east side of the school, and you know, as you were speaking, I don't know your name, but <laughs> but as you were speaking, the children and the families do go across and access and use Thompson Park immediately after school. And the school also uses Thompson Park a lot during their school day. Why has Bross never been part of a school zone flashing light or just in general? Is it because gay? is or there's there, there's no rhyme or reason or signage really stating that there is a school and there are young children in that area and i i did very good question but i don't have an answer for you uh, that that's lost to history as to why the the previous unless phil has an answer i'm not sure um but if we you know, one of, one, of, one of the things we look at when we, we, we measure an intersection is we look at what's the existing traffic, uh, foot traffic, pedestrian traffic. If there's a need and we see that, the school, uh, we, we, we have, uh, should be meeting with the school um, mostly, you know, kind of starting this time of year to start talking about some of what we, the improvements. If there's a need for it, we can certainly in, in look at it and install something. But um, part of that has to be a partnership with the school district. Um, and I don't know that, that um, you know, I just don't know the history of it. I'm going to try to channel some of the older engineers who used to work before you did. <laughs> um, one of the reasons that I've always heard, and this is coming from a planner, not an engineer, but uh, one of the reasons that we would always hear is that Gay Street is a collector street. And typically collectors are 30 mile per hour streets. And any kind of local street like Bross, so this is a collector, Third Avenue's a collector, Gay Street's a collector. Both of them had originally had um, speed limits set at 30. And now um, the idea of a school zone was to slow people down more than 10 miles per hour. So you put them on the collectors to slow people down from 30 to 20. But if you had a local street, the default speed limit on all, on all local streets, you'll see it as you come into town, is 25. So the idea was don't invest in flashers that slow people down five miles per hour. S invest in the ones that slow people down 10 or more miles per hour. So that was the logic used back then. But we've since changed it all around town. So you'll see other 25 mile per hour streets that have flashers. But it, it was a slow change, but it was one that has been coming. So that's all I know. That's very helpful to understand how uh, to answer your question. And the other thing that we've noticed is the principal said that this is the new handicap entrance to the school, and there's absolutely no um, uh, protection or loading zone at that point. I'm sure they'll they'll want to speak to you about that. I. I I got to tell you, it'd be nice if they had, had told us before they installed the, the handicap ramp. We would have worked with them, and so we'll we'll reach out to them. We'll have a chat. Any other questions for Jim? Well, I was wondering. I live on Long Street, the intersection, and we've 
done a lot of accidents. I've lived there 30 years, and I'd say if you average it out of one accident a month, and I don't know, what what's the ranking of that intersection as far as severity in town? It seems, seems like it should be pretty high. So off the top of my head, I don't know. Um, we did just uh, publish our crash study for uh, up through 2021, from 2016 to 2021. I think we do it in five year, every year in a five-year cycle. Um, I'd have to look at that data and, and see what it is. Um, but certainly, you know, we, we, we list intersections um, based on, on speed limit, and then we have a, the, the ranking based on, a, on an index of, of accidents. So it, th that is available. Um, I'd have to see if the current one has been posted to the, to the website. But that is public information that's available. So um, let me give you a card. Um, you, can get, you can email me. I can send you the, 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 that appropriate data. Higher in severity, it acts like it reaches without trying to resolve it or something. Like that, that. That's what we usually see is is as we see those higher intersections, whether it's signalized or non-signalized, those are ones that, that go to the top of the list for what we look for for safety improvements. Okay. Yeah, I, I've had at least five cars land in my yard it's over the years for after accidents. The last one was fleeing the scene after he uh, ran the stop sign and took a shortcut through my yard and almost hit me in my driveway. But uh, I get kind of getting tired of cars landing in my my, <laughs> my, my yard. When it hit my house, too. Yeah. So. So, so this is uh, of the list of unsignalized average daily traffic, 3,000 to about 12,000 vehicles a day. Um, Gay and Long's Peak is number 11 on the list. So it is on that, that the, the list of, of intersections that um, when we start looking at uh, how we're going to address them, um, that is one that we would start looking at, um, you know, as we move. Third and Gay is one we... Mr. Engstadt. Mr. Engstadt. Thank you. If I could please, um, for those that have spoken and asked questions that have not signed in, if you could please do so, I can add your name to the minutes. Uh, and since we're talking about the school <laughs> and pie in the sky ideas, because I know there was a uh, like concrete brick on Alpine for a little bit, nor way north, uh, north of 21st, and then now it turned into a speed bump. Or was there, BBs, like, in terms of my international experience, a lot of schools have, you know, textured brick ways to actually slow down cars. So, meaning this, you know, that, I know that's, you know, you're, 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 ta you're talking about a lot of money. No. Oh, yeah. But, yeah. Um, yeah. But, you know, we, we already got off topic. Um, so, but just, you know, pie in the sky ideas. And then also, you know, Shout out to Modern Roundabouts as well. I appreciate, always appreciate your comments. Thank you. We are looking at a school and a park here along third. So I'll ask this question in Longmont. Are there any land uses that warrant crosswalks without the need for site specific study? And as a follow-up, what would it take to put schools and parks into that category? I'm not sure how to answer that except to say that as, um, you know, certainly land uses are taken into, into account, but it's more of how much uh, trip generation they create as far as pedestrians and bicycles. And you're talking about two places that really do a lot of that chip, trip generation, but we're talking about an older part of town that was developed, you know, 150 plus years ago. So there's a lot of issues going into this, but uh, you know, if this were built built today, we would definitely we would have a lot of those different things taken care of with the construction of those areas today. I don't know again how to answer your question in this context, so I apologize. And 
And I, I will just say one more thing too, you know, because it's a, a, a crosswalk isn't marked necessarily, it's still a crosswalk. So you still have to stop for anybody who's trying to cross between, um, and that's not a good example because I guess you're saying it's now striped, but even if it's not marked, it's still, Yeah, and that's part of the, we talked about that with Vision Zero. I'm sorry, she just said that the cars will not stop at the at the unmarked crosswalks, which they're supposed to do by law. But I think that's part of the Vision Zero process that we talked about is the education. And that's something we're gonna have to get across to the whole city and that's gonna be tough, right? So, go ahead. To be to be fair to the drivers, um, as, as you've described, this is kind of an accreted situation that started 150 years ago. And the signs that exist don't ever say crosswalk. The, the signs are not consistent with the modern safety design. They show a picture of, I think, a lady and a child. So, you know, we, we could make a lot of improvement with a the, with the, with the little bit of money. Um, we appreciate that, and I think that's what Jim's trying to do with uh, with the different markings, because you do need to formalize it to bring it out to people to, that's part of the education process almost at this point, because people don't know the laws, and so that's something we need to do a better job when we do Vision Zero, is explain that. Are there any other questions? If not, we should probably start to reconvene and, and uh, finish up the meeting. I don't know. How you're, well, hopefully we'll Is see everybody April 6th. Uh, I think we're at the library, uh, one of the library rooms. So um, we'll hopefully see you there and um, we'll have more staff on hand that will um, be able to provide uh, um, um, any qu or answer to any questions you have. Uh, more of a one-on-one -on -one, um, kind of dynamic. Uh, I think it's gonna be, I wanna say 5.30 to 7. Is we're gonna, we'll have a short presentation to start. We're gonna update. Uh, this project, as well as some other projects that are in the area we've talked about before, Price Park Tank, uh, Kaufman Street, give you an update on that. Um, and then we'll open it up probably for about an hour of, of looking at the role plot and one-on-one um, -on -one discussion. Is there a way for people to email questions ahead of time so you have an idea of what people are going to be asking so that there's to help steer or... Yeah, I believe we are, um, when you get the letter, there will be uh, directions to, if you have questions ahead of time, you can go through our ServiceWorks um, website um, and ask questions, and we'll either answer them then or be prepared to answer them at the meeting. Could people please sign in if they got to speak at all? <laughs> that would be wonderful. Thanks for doing that. I think we got everybody. Thank you. Phil, do we want to reconvene? Sure, it's up to you. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Okay. Um, we did the, the budget discussion. Are there any, any other items from staff that we want to discuss tonight? We have some items at the end for upcoming agendas, but other than that, if you want to take member comments or board, com board member comments and council member comment, I think that's where we are on the agenda. Okay. Um, We'll start to my right. Um, 
No, that was fun. And Jim, th thank you for dealing with me and my my crazy ideas. But I always like to think big. Um, and and I do appreciate the comment that you made about the new engineer and uh, being a bit, uh, you know, thinking outside of uh, the two ton box a little bit sometimes. So so that's uh, encouraging to hear, uh, especially for for future projects. Um, but. Um, yeah, that, that's that's all my thoughts. Thank you. Yes, the uh, 2021 crash report presented at the board's December meeting compared Longmont to peer communities based on some incomplete and outdated information. Staff agreed to revise the crash report, what's the status of that revision? Uh, staff will check up on that and see where we are on, with all that information. So we'll, um, unfortunately the one staff member is out today, usually makes it, and she, <laughs> pro she probably could answer that question right here tonight, but uh, we'll get back with you at our April meeting and answer that question for you. All right, you do recall the issue involved though. Yeah, we have the notes, and and we won't just we won't just have it um, an update on that. We'll have it done by then. We'll get make sure. I mean, it, it was done last year. We should have had it updated and revised. So if it hasn't gotten done because we've gotten distracted by other things, we'll make sure it gets done, and our report to you in April will say, oh yeah, here it is. Okay, thanks. Council Member Yarbrough. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just want to make sure that, um, do you all want me to mention city at, during city council meeting tomorrow about the, uh, the presentation for Third Street? Um, I know you're gonna put out, send out information, but would you like for me to mention that during Council comments on tomorrow night. One of one of the, the the standard practices we follow is we will be sending out an email invite to city council uh, for that public meeting. Uh, that will go out before we do a press release on it. Okay. So we we've had that covered via communications. Um, so uh, if you'd like to, sure, but we'll have it covered anyway. So council will be advised of it. Um, uh, as we, you know, similar to, you got the email this weekend, earlier on Friday for the mine, when we see press release coming, we, we send a notice directly to council <coughs> so they have that information ahead of the press release. Yeah, okay. Well, you know, Friday and Saturday were retreat. Nobody looked at their emails. A little, little busy. <laughs> a little busy. Um, okay, I just want to make sure, because you know there's always somebody, we need to use all measurements of communication as possible because somebody will say they never knew about it, they didn't see it, they didn't know that it was happening, they didn't know all those things were going on. Um, I do also just want to reiterate to the board about the capital improvement project. Now that I've, you know, learning so much more that just because you put out something and you say this is an estimate cost, it you know you always have to come back because of adjustments or modifications and things like that. Um, and I totally get it and understand. Um, Vision Zero, uh, I'm in support of Vision Zero. I already had the city order those uh, light up bracelets, so <laughs> so. Um, I, I, I can't speak for all my other, my co-counselors, but I'm totally 100% in support of preventative measurements uh, in order to keep our pedestrians and all of our community safe as possible. And the number one thing, uh, the key for that preventative is education and community engagement. And so I think for the board is to continuously think about some, some ways that we can engage our community about this new opportunity for us, for all community members, because we all have to play a part. You know, just be, we can't assume like over there on Broughts and Third that 
there's a school and people have common sense to slow down during the school, that doesn't happen. Common sense is not so common all the time. So we do have to educate people because we do have so many people that are moving in our wonderful city to live here. So it's important. And so if you all as a board can come up with some suggestions and uh, about how we can engage the community and communicate with them in a more effective, effective and efficient way, please, we take all suggestions so that we can start putting that in place, you know, when we adopt that plan. But just know that Councilwoman Yarbrough is on board for Vision Zero. And thank you all for what you do, everything. Yeah, you got your bracelet. <laughs> yeah, you know, the, the only thing I want to add is I'm really heartened by the fact that we had so many citizens come in today. And, and that's advocacy right there that hopefully they're going to go out and, and talk about things like Vision Zero. Um, and Councilmember Yar Yarborough's words are, are true, is, is that community engagement is probably going to get us farthest in terms of the, the results of Vis Vision Zero than all the changes you can make design-wise to signs and, and, and roundabouts, whatever it might be. Um, so I'm heartened by that, that, that they showed up today. And, and maybe from that, that would be a seed that we would we would have folks talk about Vision Zero. Um, and I completely agree with you. And I do think we should brainstorm on what are the ways that we can create community engagement around Vision Zero. Um, because I, I hate to say it, I think traditionally the, what, the Saturday morning coffees and some of the other things, as they're, they're tried and true, but they're tried and true with the same crowd. So how are we going to engage folks that n would not normally engage, especially with something that's so critical about mobility, transportation, it's talking about equity. So um, I, I guess it's going to be an ongoing project, and, and we're going to have to work. And I know we've mentioned how much community engagement has been built into Vision Zero. I remember the conversation when we had about Vision, Vision Zero prior. So that's all I'll say about that. But I think tonight was, was a, a, a good success for not having votes and <laughs> So with that, um, since we don't really have to do any sort of uh, um, what second in, in motion, we'll go ahead and end this meeting. And yes, Phil, you want to add? Just want to make sure we have your follow-up items for the next agenda, kind of listed out so we can kind of put it on record. Um, actually, typically in April we do an RTD update. So that's typically when you have RTD come. But I think our April schedule is so full that we might want to postpone that off a month or two. So um, we did get the update on Gay Street that you wanted to hear about, so we've got that on our schedule. Uh, we want to talk about uh, the transportation mobility plan and how it works with the enhanced multi-use corridors and, and maybe a little bit more discussion on how the plans will kind of come together with that in Vision Zero. And then there is the Vision Zero resolution that you've asked for, as well as the update on the crash report and making sure we get the crash report to you uh, correctly. Finalized. So um, those are the big four issues that we have. And again, I think we'll push RTD off just one more month and uh, work it into your schedule that way. No, so if that seems appropriate. Good, okay. Yeah. Just wanted to confirm. Thank you. Okay. I guess uh, we're adjourned. Do we want to discuss board recruitment or? I think we'll need to do that at the April meeting as well. I think that's a good addition to start yeah. the discussion and figure out how we put that together. Who wants to be on the on the interview committee? If it's one, two, three, or four of you, I, I think two was. <laughs> I think actually two is effective when it was uh, okay. Council Member Os Osborne and, and myself. Um, but the openings are listed on the Prime Gov Sub Longmont site. Is that correct? Right, we should have probably done a little bit more sales job with the people who are all here in the audience. Probably <laughs> should, should have. Them, so hopefully they can still hear us out there. But um, Maybe throw a banner up on the website, you know. Transportation board needs you, you know, that yeah. sort of a thing. <laughs> Perfect. Did, did we get that on the record? Because that was really good, yeah. Okay, I think we're adjourned.